this morning, as we look at Psalm 139, this is a praise psalm. And this is one of my favorite psalms, and it's one of the psalms that I believe that we can go to often in our life. Not just to read it, but to understand it and memorize it, commit it to our hearts. Just what a wonderful, beautiful uh, words that we see here about our Lord. I'm going to read the first five verses. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsetting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. In verse 23 through 24, I believe this could be the chorus to this song. I believe if this psalm was a song, this would be the chorus, because we keep coming back to this verse 23 and verse 24 when we read about the, how wonderful God is to us. It says in verse 23, The search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So this is a plea. This is our desire. This is our heart's desire that the Lord search us thoroughly. The Lord knows our hearts. And we go back up to verse 1. So actually, through all the divisions in Psalm 139, we're going to keep referring to Psalm 23. You cannot escape or outrun the love of God. If you're saved here today, God loves you with an everlasting love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We cannot escape or outmaneuver God or his plans. He's already at the end of them. He is behind us. God's before us. He's above us. He's below us. If you're saved and you're a child of God today, no matter where you are, God is there. And he will be there with you and in you. There is no escaping God. He is the eternal one. He is the governor. He is the final judge. He is the final note. He is the final chapter that will never end. Everything invisible and visible point to God. And not only do they point to God, but God has complete control in his power, in his hands. The reason you were born today was because of God. The reason if you were born again is because of God. The reason you are alive right now is because of God. If, if you've been backsliding or ignoring God, if, if God had saved you and you've been ignoring him and backsliding, you're still not running away from God. God is still there. It is only because he's allowed it for a, for, uh, for a certain amount of time. But he's still there. We know that the day is coming. We know as God's people that the day is coming that every mouth will stop, every knee shall bow, and everyone will see Christ to the glory of his Father, and that that is the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus. Every mouth will confess that he is Christ. We do not know when that day is coming, but we know it is coming, and that God is already at that day. You know, time is no constraint to God. All the events in our lives have all been determined before as if they've already happened. You know, time was created by God for us. God stands outside of time. He's the past. He's the present. He's the future. He's in all three, all at the same time. He's in my tomorrow. I'm not in tomorrow yet, but God is. And he is holding me and he has me secure. There's no outrunning or escaping the Lord. Now here's the most amazing and unfathomable thing that we see from the scriptures that our almighty God, creator, holy, sovereign, self-existing one, him, him being before eternity and infinity, that he knows me. Amen. That he loves me. 
In verse 1 of Psalms, it says, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Now, like I said in verse 23, that's the heart's invitation. Lord, please search me. But in verse 1, we already know that He has already searched our hearts. Verse 23 is the submission to the Lord. Lord, take my life. Take my heart. Search me. Change me. Make me the be what I need to be to be in joy in the will of the Lord. And that's what we all need to seek is the joy in the will of God. Once we can be content with the will of God, once we can understand the love of God in our hearts and knows that, he, that, we, know that we, he has our best interests because he loved us and he gave his son for us. What else? I mean, this afternoon we're going to be in Romans chapter 5 and what a demonstration of love that he put at the cross. Not only does God shed his love abroad in our hearts, we feel God's love, but we see God's love as he demonstrated love at the cross that he died for us. God loves us through Jesus Christ and his son. In verse 2, so we know that God knows us. Now, verse, I'm going to go back to verse 1 real quickly. Once we understand and be honest with this verse, thou hast searched me and known me. Let's be honest about this verse. God knows you. He knows you like I don't know you. I, I, I used to think there was only two people that ever really, really knew me, and that was my mother and my wife. But God knows me more than they do. He knows me more than I know myself. He understands us. We, we know that we cannot hide thoughts. We cannot hide motives. We cannot hide agendas. We cannot hide the intents of our hearts. We cannot hide pride if things are, uh, and, you know, the wrong motivation for us. He has searched me and known me. He knows my weaknesses. He knows my strengths. Just as Brother Chapman said in Sunday school, he knows our frail frame. He knows where we fail. He knows where we struggle. My struggle may not be your struggle, and your struggle may not be my struggle, but there's days that I pray the Lord will help me through this struggle. It may be an attitude that you need to overcome. It may be a, a love that you need to embrace more and more in your life, and you ask God to bless you. God already knows you need that blessing because He knows you. He knows your struggles. He knows the, the victories in your life. He knows the joy in your life. God knows all things in general, but to his children, there's a special knowledge that God has of us. Oh, I, I love David's praise here in Psalm 139. In verse 2, he says, Thou, thou knowest my downsetting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. These are the details of his knowledge. He knows us. He understands us. Now, what's interesting is when you start looking at this, you'll notice the, the way that David says my a lot. He'll say, thou knowest my downsetting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. The wanted to get to it. If you are writing notes, we see five points, five divisions in here in Psalm 139. And hopefully... I know I'll have to go fast, but hopefully the Lord will, will bless you with something here. And I know I want to get to verse 24, but this may be a part two. Because anytime we start talking about the character and the attributes of God, it, we must slow down just by design to be able to absorb just a little bit of God's attributes and his character. But in verses 1 through 6, we see his omniscience. We see God's total Knowledge. Now, not only do we love and we wonder and study God's total knowledge, but here in, verse, in chapter 139, we're taking all of God's glorious, unfathomable attributes, and we're applying those attributes to ourself. That God's total knowledge, He knows me. And we're going to get, get ready to see, in verses 7 through 12, it talks about His total presence. We know that God is omnipresent. He's all things. He's everywhere. But yet, He's with me. 
And so as we continue in Psalm 139, in verses 12 through 18, we see his total power, his omnipotence. And yet we know that God is all-powerful. But how, what a wonder it is that he is all-powerful for me and in me. So we see that his total knowledge is of me. His total presence is with me. His total power is for me in salvation. And then in 18 through 21, we see his complete and total righteousness and holiness to judge sin and to change our lives. We desire God. We love God. And we we love God to the point that we desire the people who are around us to love God. That we do that the love of God will change the company you keep. It should. It should. And then verse 22 through 23, I like to say, is the chorus of the verse. Because as long as you keep going into these divisions, we, we, we keep coming back to verse 23. Lord, this, it, it, how comforting it is to know that God knows me, that he's with me, that he's for me, and he searches my heart. So at verse 23, I'm going to ask, Lord, please continue to search my heart and change me to be who I need to be. So I can walk in the joy of the Lord. I can be pleasing to the Lord. So that's when we submit to God changing our heart. That's when we submit to God changing our life every day. But I want to get more into the beauty of this. He, God understands me in verse 2 through 6. He understands my thoughts afar off. Thou compasseth my path and my lying down. Uh, quickly, in verse 2, when he says, Thou knowest my downsetting and my uprising. There's three ways you can really take this. You can take it literally. He knows where we go to sleep, and he knows where we rise. You can take it emotionally, that he knows when we are in despair, and he knows when we are in joy. He knows our downsetting and our uprising, correct? He knows the things that uh, weary us or discourage us. He knows the things that encourage us, even better than we know them. And so you can also do it spiritually. Thou knowest, Lord, that I have difficulty praying. I have difficulty loving as I should love others. I have difficulty um, being the saint that I need to be to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I need to love them fervently. I need to pray for them. I need to lift them up. Lord, teach me to, to put them before my own needs. Help me. And spiritually, he knows where we need work. And he knows where we receive joy. And isn't it wonderful how the Lord tempers the body, his church, together as steel. And he brings all of our strengths and all of our weaknesses and how the work must go on and that we're all unified. And God knows what he's doing. God knows. Uh, he, he knows who he's saving daily as should be saved. He knows who he's adding to his churches. He's putting them there by design. It's no accident that we're here this morning. You know, I, I, I praise the Lord. I think we all saw how God, you know, uh, as pastor was going through the situation where he could not come up and serve as he was serving, that God had already had people in the church that would be able to lift the burden off the pastor until he's better, until the Lord can give him the strength to come back. You know, it reminds me, you know, I'm... I'm content, and we should all be content whatever the will of God is, because that's where your joy will be, is when we're content with the will of God. At the, you know, don't ever let pride or any of those things come in your way, because who am I? <laughs> who are you? Amen. You know, that we're nobody, and we're fortunate, we're privileged, we're, thank you, Lord, for using me in any way in thy kingdom. Thank you for saving me to begin with. And as, as Pastor says, if, we, if God were to take everything away from us today and we were left on a heap of ashes scraping boils off of our arms, that we should still have much to praise the Lord for, that these days of, of weariness and discouragement are short compared to the glory that is to come. 
You know, we, we can spend this whole life worrying and being miserable, but let us look forward to what Christ has done in the victory of the cross, that we have the victory in Christ. And if you're in Christ today, you have victory every day of your life, no matter what comes, that you have the victory and you have a joy that's before you. Oh, what I, I love the, the words here, how he says, verse 3, thou compasseth my past. That means that God has spread out your path like a blanket. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. God has already spread out the path of our lives, that he is omniscient, he is all-knowing, and that he, his providence in our life. And, you know, we can sit back and... Uh, really praise God in the assurance of our hope and faith that tomorrow the Lord has got in control. Why am I worried about tomorrow? God's already compassed my path about. I, I know I'm going to heaven when I die because the sufficiency of my salvation is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ would have had to fail before I fail because I'm in Christ. And my faith and trust is in the success of Christ, is in the faith in Christ value to God and we know that that's his God or Jesus is his only begotten son whom he loves and now God loves me through Christ and that's the only way that God will have mercy and grace upon any person ever born is through Jesus Christ being in Christ in verse 4 he says for there is not a word in my tongue but oh lo O oh Lord thou knowest it all together thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. That word beset is to lock, is to set into position. That he is, he does, he restrains things in our life. He builds a hedge about us. That he has beset us before and he's beset us behind and his hand is continually upon us in our life. I'm not alone. I'm not alone in this life. I have someone who loves me with a love I can't even comprehend or understand. And that he loves me. And even he has control over the things of my life. He besets me before. He besets me behind. And he has total knowledge. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that God spreads these events. In verse 4, we see his omniscience. In verse 5, we see his providence. In verse 6, we see again his omniscience. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. We don't have time to turn there, but uh, if you write down Isaiah 55, verse 7, it talks about that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. As high as the heaven is above the earth, so are his ways above our ways. Oh, what a, what a mercy he's given us. We, you know, aren't you glad today? That God is long-suffering and that He forgives and that He has mercy. Aren't you glad that His ways are not my way where I'm short to forgive? I, I may not, you know, I may hold a grudge. I, I'm so glad God does not hold a grudge against sin because I'd be in a lot of trouble. And so when, I'm so thankful God's ways are above my ways. In verse, again, we, we see this in verse 5. He besets us behind and before. In verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful. Okay, so Isaiah 55, 7. Also, Job 42, verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Now think about that. If God did not understand you, how could he give you counsel? If God did not understand everything that's going on with you, he could not give you counsel, but he does. And Job is to the point where you know it, I don't. Even Job's own heart. Therefore have I uttered, Job said, therefore have I uttered that I understand not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. God is gloriously worthy to be praised and he's glori gloriously worthy to be trusted. And gloriously, we can trust him and lean on him. And how many times do we see the, oh, David's just beautiful, poetic uh, words that God inspired David to write about him hiding us under the shadow of his wing and uh, just being 
you know, to us, our love and our Father, and just with a love we cannot comprehend. In verse 7, we go from his total knowledge to his total presence. Whether shall I go? Where can I go? From thy spirit. Or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, which is Sheol, which means the grave, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. And that's why I'm saying you cannot outrun God. You cannot be separated from God. That God's power keeps us beset with Him. That I'm always with God. God's always with me. I'm never alone. And he says, and even in thy, and even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Shall hold me. <laughs> shall hold me. If David was all alone and everybody betrayed him on earth, God is still there. That he's holding him. And he says in verse 11, he talks about fear. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. We convince ourselves so much to fear, and I do it. We're all guilty of it. We invent the situations in our life to bring us more fear and more fear and more worry, even when the darkness comes upon us. We're always worst-case scenario. That's just human nature is worst-case scenario. What happens tomorrow? What happens then? But look at this in verse 12. Yea, the darkness hideth not from me, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. We have nothing to fear in God. We, his presence is with us. There is nothing to fear. He is not only there with you, but he's in control. And Proverbs 3.24 says, When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and they shall be sweet. I cannot run, I cannot hide. In Jeremiah 23, it says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? And God's saying that, Can any hide where I cannot see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? He has in verse 11, The things that scare me do not scare God. The things that scare me do not scare God. If you're going through a time of fear and anxiety and you feel there's no hope and darkness is winning, God is still there. Darkness is nothing to God. In verses 13 through 16, and here we're in the section of God's omnipotence, His total power for us. Look at this in verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance, which is our skeleton, was not hid. It's, it's, our, it's our framework. It's our bodies. Was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. This is another poetic part of speech where this lowest parts of earth it's talking about the mother's womb because just like a cave or a cavern that's underneath the world or underneath the earth it's both dark and lonely and he says in the mother's womb is dark and it, you're alone in the mother's womb but even there he was curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth he says thine eyes did see my substance Yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when I as yet there was none of them. How precious <laughs> also are thy thoughts unto me. O oh God, how great is the sum of them. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I'm not going to see the wrath of God. I'm so happy that God does not consider me an enemy that I'm a son, I'm adopted, I'm joint heir, I was purchased with the price of his precious blood, that there's nothing that the Lord wouldn't give me. There's no presence that the Lord wouldn't let me sense in my darkest hour. There's, he's going to be with me. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. He's going to give me grace. 
in my darkest times and in my trials. And even if I stand in jeopardy or I stand in uh, the face of danger proclaiming the, the word of the Lord, we're going to see a peace that he's going to bring to us through the Holy Spirit just as he brought upon Stephen who had the face as an angel. <laughs> uh, the Stephen knew what he was up against. But the Lord brought him that peace that passes understanding. I believe we're going to face death the same way. We're going to come to that point where God will give us grace through every trial to get through. I, I'm out of time, but I, just what an encouragement and what a blessing and what a wonder Psalm 139 is. Because he says, How precious also are thy thoughts to me. Uh, in Psalm 116.15, he says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints and that we should cast all our cares upon him for he careth for us I didn't have time to get to it but in verse 22 now in verse 19 through 22 is the holiness and the righteousness of God his total righteousness and in verse 20, 21 he says do I not hate them O Lord that hate thee and, and am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them with mine enemies. Uh, imagine you've reached the point where you've, you've come to this point of the psalm and you have celebrated and worshipped God for who He is and all the more falling in love with the Lord. You've reached this point where you don't want to hear people badmouth your God. You don't want to hear people badmouth your love. Imagine a love that we're supposed to love more than anything else on earth. We don't want to hear people talk about our Lord. We don't want to hear those things. We want to separate ourselves from them. But verse 23 again is the commitment part. We can sit and we can wonder and we can marvel and we can grow comfort and peace. Hallelujah, we can. But in verse 23, here's the part. Search me, O Lord, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting he knows me he is with me he loves me and he will forgive me if God's love is so high above our understanding and is incomprehension so he will give us and forgive us of all things if we come to him and repent repentance is when God works sorrow in your heart and you realize you've fallen short of God. You realize that you've been backsliding. You realize that you've not been dedicating your life to the love of your life, which should be the Lord. He gives us these verses of praise and worship, and we dwell on them. And we understand that there is no hiding from God. There's no running from God. If you're one of God's children, that he loves you. He gave himself for you. Let us turn back to the Lord and ask him, plead with him to search me and show me if there's any way that I need to repent today. Lord, bring back the joy of thy salvation into my life. If you're not saved here this day, the Lord ha has said that whosoever believeth upon him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We come believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ that he, was, he died and he was buried and that he was rose again the third day for the forgiveness of my sins. He's my substitute. And there I put my full faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The invitation is a day, and today is a day of salvation. If the Lord's talked to your heart, we invite you to come. Let's all stand, please, Brother Chapman and Sister Kathy, if you would. Let's have a word. Of I shall